Welcome to the 86th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Allison Leota, author of the legal suspense thrillers, Discretion and Law of Attraction. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Allison Leota, a former federal sex crimes prosecutor and legal thriller writer. Leota's latest novel is Discretion, which is available in bookstores now. Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Sure. Well, first, can I ask you to read the first three or four paragraphs of Discretion? Absolutely. I'd be delighted to. All right, starting with Chapter 1, then. Even now, Caroline got nervous before every big job, and this was bigger than most. She knew how to smile past smirking hotel concierges and apartment building doormen who deliberately looked the other way. The key was looking confident. But committing a crime in the U.S. Capitol was a different experience altogether. She tried to radiate authority as she strode up the marble steps to the Capitol Senate carriage entrance. It helped that she was dolled up like a successful K Street lobbyist. Ivory suit, no low heels, hair painstakingly highlighted to just the right shade of blonde. Two men coming out of the portico murmured hello to her, and she smiled as if she greeted congressional staffers all the time. One staffer turned to watch her pass. His glance was appreciative, but not shocked. She was young and beautiful, but she looked like she belonged in this world of high-octane political deal-making. Good. She stepped out of the muggy August twilight and into the air-conditioned cool of the security vestibule. To calm herself, she concentrated on the feeling of lace garters skimming her thighs. This was one of the riskiest moments, so she arranged her face into its brightest smile. Hello. She greeted the two Capitol Police officers with cool professionalism. I have an appointment with Congressman Lionel. Great. Well, if the, if the listeners haven't heard about discretion yet, how would you describe the novel? Uh, well, it starts with a beautiful young woman being killed in the hideaway of a, of a congressman's office in the U.S. Capitol. And it's about the political sex scandal and the murder investigation into her death. And it features a sex crimes prosecutor named Anna Curtis, who holds the same job that I held for almost a decade. She's a federal prosecutor in D.C. where she specializes in sex crimes and domestic violence. So we've got a little bit of murder mystery, a little bit of romance, a little bit of legal thriller. Um, and it's fun. It's a It's a fun sort of beach read or this sort of read you, uh, that'll keep you going on the Stairmaster, I hope. Great. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as you just said, you're, you're a former federal sex crimes prosecutor. What, what led you to writing legal thrillers? And when you were working as a prosecutor, did you know all along that you wanted to write novels one day? I didn't know all along. I've always been just a voracious reader. Since I was a little kid, I, I couldn't get enough of books. I was always reading with a flashlight after bedtime under my covers. Um, as a prosecutor, though, I was coming home from court all the time and saying, I, I can't believe that this just happened today. This incredible thing just happened in court. And my friends, my colleagues, and I would, would talk about this all the time. This happened, that happened, all these war stories we were sharing with each other. And it would usually end with one of us saying, somebody needs to put this in a book. That's kind of the battle cry at the end of each of these war stories. And um, finally, I got I, I decided to put my money where my mouth was when I got pregnant, of all things, uh, with my first child. And I realized the world as I knew it was about to change and free time <laughs> as I knew it was about to change. And if I was going to do it, it was now or never. So that's when I actually sat down and, and started trying to take these experiences from every day in the courthouse and weave them into one story that would kind of encompass what it was like to be there. And and what was that what was that process like for you? Did you did you have to end up doing multiple drafts? Did it come easy to you? What what was that like? I no, it, it never comes easy, but <laughs> I love I love doing it. It was uh, any time I really got into it, and any time I had a free moment, that's what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be writing this story. I took to carrying this computer around with me, um, this huge, like, 15-pound computer. <laughs> Wherever I went, that, that computer was with me, and if I had a free moment, 
I would I would write it mostly when I was writing was before work and and I've heard this that if you really want to do something that you should do it first thing in the morning when you're fresh and and new because when you get home at night you just want to sit down and watch the Daily Show or, or what have you so um, I would wake up at five and I'd write for two hours from five till seven in the morning before heading to work and it was actually kind of this this interesting thing because I'd be thinking about while I was at the office things would happen, I'd be like, oh, I'm, I can put that into my, into my manuscript. I'll, I'll, I'll include that detail in, in the next chapter. Um, and then at home, I'd, I'd be writing the story. And while I was writing, you know, I'd be writing something from a, a victim or survivor's point of view. And it would um, make me sit in the chair that that person had been sitting in across the office from me instead of at my desk and, and put me in, literally in her shoes um, it, in a way that I hadn't been before, and it made me, I think, a better prosecutor as well to have this deeper level of um, empathy and and really trying to to figure out what it felt like to sit in that chair in my office. And and once you finished that manuscript, what was the to, the path to publication like for you? I'm assuming you found an agent, and 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 what was that process like? I did. I found an agent. I I, I was very very lucky. Um, uh, a woman who graduated from my law school a couple years after me, her name's Julie Buxbaum. She writes really wonderful um, fiction, literary fiction. She had an agent. Uh, I called her. She called her agent. Her agent was interested. And her agent was one of my first choice agents. And she very quickly, after she, she got my manuscript, and in about seven days, she was very enthusiastic and wanted to sign me. So That's great. So I signed up. But- yeah, I know. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. I don't have one of those great stories of perseverance. <laughs> I have a story of uh, um, And then, actually, the, the process ground to halt for a little while because I, I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm, this, I'm a prosecutor. I'm at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., and I'm writing this story. It's fiction, but it takes place in the U.S. Attorney's Office, in the, in the kind of fictional version of the U.S. Attorney's Office. I wonder if this needs to go past my ethics advisors. So I just shot a quick email to my ethics advisor and said, hey, we don't need to do anything about this, do we? And he wrote back and was like, well, yes, actually, hold the presses. We, we do. We need to run a review. So um, uh, my boss is at the U.S. Attorney's Office and then some ethics advisors at Maine Justice, professional responsibility officers, had to read the book and make sure I wasn't violating any DOJ rules. And that process took about four months. And when it, when it cleared that process... Then my agent sold it to Touchstone at Simon & Schuster. That's great. Did you have to end up making a lot of changes through that process? Not really. They were mostly looking at it to make sure I hadn't um, like revealed national security secrets, <laughs> which usually sex crimes, domestic violence doesn't, most of the time, most of the time. And um, th- they asked for little things, like I talked about how, to, how I badged my way into the courthouse, into the U.S. Attorney's Office. They wanted me to take out details like that. Um, but mostly they left it alone, and and they didn't touch the. Um, there are some racy scenes, and I was I was very glad that nobody wanted to talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you you write a popular blog called Primetime Crime Review, which has been listed as a top legal blog by the American Bar Association for the last two years. And on your blog, yeah. you you often critique crime TV shows. With, with the various crime shows that you've watched, is there one particular error or mistake that kind of sticks out in your mind as the most egregious? Oh, goodness. There are so many. There are so many. That's, I think, why I'm writing the blog, because before I was watching these shows and I would get so frustrated and many slippers were thrown at the TV. So this has been much, much more constructive um, to blog about it. But uh, so some of the most egregious, there's always fingerprints on guns. <laughs> and, and these TV shows, and in real life, you never get a fingerprint off a gun. I've never called a fingerprint expert to talk about the fingerprint that was found on the gun. I always am call- was calling fingerprint experts to, to educate the jury on why fingerprints are not on guns. So, so that's one. As a sex crimes prosecutor, one that gets me from watching Law and Order SVU all the time is every victim of sexual assault there has um, intimate injuries, vaginal injuries. And in real life, that's not the case. In the majority of sexual assault, that doesn't happen. And the reason why this is a pet peeve of mine is because as a prosecutor, you are fighting this effect. Sometimes it's called the CSI effect, where the jury comes to court with these expectations because they've been watching the show. 
And in the sex crimes cases, what they think is um, be because these injuries are always talked about in, on SVU, they think if a woman does or if a, any sort of rape victim doesn't have these intimate injuries, she must have been consenting. It must have been okay with her, and therefore it wasn't a sexual assault. And that's just not true. It's just not anatomically the way that that, you know, that piece of anatomy works. It's anatomy that can stretch to fit a baby. But... So that's that's a big one because it's it's not only wrong but it creates a much more difficult burden for sex crimes prosecutors when they're trying to convince a jury um, about what really happened. Gotcha. So, gotcha. With, with, so with two novels published, what tips or advice would you offer for aspiring writers? Mm, I think it's mostly about tenacity. I think you have to be talented. You have to uh, you have a way with words and and be able to tell a good story. But a lot of that is about just sticking with it. It's not going to come out beautiful the first time. I, I don't know really any writer whose writing comes out beautiful and perfect the first time. It's about writing, getting it out there, and then going back and like cutting half of what you wrote before and writing some more, and then going back and cutting half of that and writing some more and, and really taking the time to figure out um, what works. But the key is sticking with it, letting it come out, even if it's coming out bad, just have it come out. And a little bit of that you're going to be able to save. Um, but it's all about tenacity. Keep going back to it the next day. If it's not working that day, go to sleep and wake up the next morning and try again. Gotcha. And and you've talked about your, your work as a sex crimes prosecutor and, and you know, your your first manuscript had to go through this review. Uh, are you are you still in the in the writing that you're doing now? Are you kind of looking back at, at those war stories that you mentioned as as kind of a jumping off point for for novels or future novels that you're thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many stories. I'm not sure I could write all of them in a lifetime. So, yes. And, and the question isn't really uh, where am I going to find my next story, but just which story do you choose? Because whatever story you choose, you have to be willing to live in that world for the next year, at least, as you create that world. And every day you're going to be thinking about that place so uh, closely and, and it's just going to inhabit your mind. For, so you want to make sure it's something that you can live with for a year. But there are so many. Uh, I mean, if you spent a day in Superior Court, Jeff, you would leave with probably an idea for six different stories. So <laughs> it's, uh, there's, there's definitely uh, a, a lot of great, rich material in the courthouse. Gotcha. Well, you mentioned gotcha. earlier that you're a voracious reader. What what books, fiction or nonfiction, have you read lately that that made an impact on you and that you would recommend? Mm -hmm. the, I read a great book by another prosecutor, uh, William Landay. It's called Defending Jacob. It's really wonderful. It's the best legal thriller that I've read in years and years, decades. It's a lovely book. It's kind of an intersection between legal thriller and kind of a domestic family drama. And, and just the relationship between the characters was really beautifully drawn. Um, I, I belong to a book club, just you know, a bunch of ladies who get together. We usually <laughs> read contemporary literary fiction. We love, everybody agreed. One of our favorites recently was um, The Post Birthday World by Lionel Shriver. It's kind of like a, a thinking woman's um, sliding doors. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's about a woman who, who's in this committed relationship and she's tempted to um, go with this, this snooker player. And, and, and you see the two parallel lives as she, she does or doesn't kiss the snooker player. So it was, it was fascinating, I thought. It was really fun. That's great. Uh, so what are you working on now? Are you writing a new novel? Yeah, funny you should ask. I just turned in my third novel to my publisher on Friday. So um, I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting my editor's uh, comments and suggestions, and, I, and then I'll work on polishing that up. So that, that's going to be the third uh, novel in the Anna Curtis series. It's going to be the, the sequel to Discretion. Great. Well, where can people find you online? Ah, my website is alisonleota.com, A-L-L-I-S-O-N-L-E-O-T-T-A.com. Great. And my well, blog is there, too. Yes. Well, again, we've been speaking with Allison Leota, author of Discretion, which is available in bookstores now. Allison, thanks for doing the interview. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff.